great to see y'all. If not, uh, are there any first or second time visitors? All right, we have a visitor's card. We want to welcome you to the GS family. Uh, definitely a great place to be. Also, is this anybody's last Sunday or is next Sunday anybody's last Sunday? Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's clap it up for them. <laughs> Thank y'all. All right, let's greet each other with some air hugs, air daps, and air high fives. All right, good afternoon, GS fam. I would ask you to bow your heads as I usher us into the spirit. Thank you, Lord, for waking us up this morning. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to see another day. Your word says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore the land. We ask you to forgive us, Lord, so our land can be healed. Father God, I pray for the leadership guidance. Let every leader from the president, NATO partners, local nationals, commanders, all the way down to the youngest airmen seek not to pursue their own interests, but to look at the interests of others. I pray that you help our leaders to identify the needs of your people through divine wisdom and understanding. Lord, help them to be effective leaders and show them how in the area of the influence that you have given them. Thank you for Chaplain Hughes as she delivers your message today, dear Father God. I ask you give her a double portion of anointing. And these things we ask in your name. Amen. Good afternoon, GS family. So if you can join me, we're going to do the responsive reading. Our text is, today is going to come from Psalms, the 23rd chapter, verse 1 through 3 and 5 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths bringing honor to his name. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will ha live in the house of the Lord forever. Better is one day in your course than a thousand elsewhere. 
Better is one day in your coins, and better is one day in your house, better is one day in your coins, and a thousand elsewhere, a thousand elsewhere. Conspired 
they told their lies that they would me my character my integrity my faith in god he favors me will not fall will not bend won't compromise god favors me i speak life and prosperity and i speak God favors me, they whisper, conspire, they told their lies. God favors me, my character, my integrity, my faith in God. He favors me, will not fall, will not bend, won't compromise. God favors me, I speak life and prosperity and i speak hell god, god favors, favors me, me. They, they whisper conspire they told their lies god, god favors me my character my integrity my faith in god god favors me will not fall will not bend won't compromise god favors me i speak life Prosperity and I speak life. God favors me. Say yes, yes, yes. Say yes. God favors me. Say yes, yes. Say yes. God favors me. Say yes, yes. Say yes. He favors me. Conspired. They told their lies. God favors me. My character, my integrity, my faith in God. He favors me. Will not fall, will not bend. Won't compromise. God favors me. I speak life, prosperity, and I speak And He favors me. Good afternoon, GS fam. I missed last week, so it's good to be back. Good to see you guys. Um, I've got several announcements for you today. <clears throat> First of all, with the um, base kind of opening up and us being able to travel into Turkey and explore, we really need to grow our volunteer, have kind of a robust volunteer group. So we always need people, ushers, singers, I mean, especially here with the PCS season and, and people just cycling out, like our, our singers go from like a lot of singers to nothing overnight, it seems like. So if that's speaking to you, um, please think about volunteering. There's plenty of other opportunities for you to volunteer in. We can always use a hand and, and just, we just need a, a servant's heart and you'd be willing to just fill whatever position God would have you do that week. So. Um, next Sunday, with that being said, next Sunday, the 7th of February, we will be having our volunteer training immediately after service in our conference room. Um, and so also on, the su on Sunday the 7th is our fellowship Sunday. So there's um, every first Sunday we meet after church. There's a big feast. Bring a friend. They don't have to feel obligated to bring anything. We just want to show, you to show up. Bring a friend, let us bless them, let us have some self fellowship with the body of Christ and just get to know each other. Um, there is a sign-up sheet. The food is already bought by the chapel. If you have signed up or if you want to sign up for some of the empty slots, please do that and then um, get with chapel leadership and they'll get you the food. We just need someone to make it and bring it that Sunday, okay? <clears throat> Okay, and then the chapel-sponsored 4K run that was supposed to be this week got moved to next Saturday at 10 a.m. There's a sign-up sheet in the back if you want to actually participate in that. It's 4K uh, run for a maskless world, I think it's called, so that's awesome. Um, 
if you want to actually volunteer and be one of the volunteers to help put that, that event on, please put an asterisk by your name on that sign-up sheet, okay? And then if you, won't mi if you don't mind, look at your, your uh, bulletin here. I know we have one new member, but, um, you know, at Insurlick here, we, we serve as each other's family. Whether it's in your work center or here, we definitely want to be part of your family. So we want to engage it with you. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities during the week that you can um, keep engaged with the body of Christ. There's each one of these discipleship opportunities has a point of contact that you could reach out to, get more information on that. I highly encourage for you to keep um, connected and a part of the body of Christ during the week. Lastly, all volunteers, <coughs> excuse me, even the ones that are going to sign up and, and be at next Sunday's um, volunteer training, all volunteers, please stay after service and meet with Imani Phillips. Um, for in the future, we're going to have a volunteer appreciation lunch, dinner, something like that. So if that kind of encourages you to sign up to volunteer, great. Um, now we're going to move into tithes and offerings. Good afternoon, GF family. Welcome once again. We've reached the point of service that we can all participate in. That's with the tithes and offerings. So in your program, there is, um, you can scan the QR code and it'll take you to a web page. You can donate via credit card, um, whether it's one time or for the whole year if you wanted to. If you have cash because you were able to make it to finance or to the ATM, we'll gladly, um, the ushers will come around and you can uh, drop it in the hand. So, me in a word of prayer for the tithes and offerings. My God, my Heavenly Father, bless the tithes and offerings we give today. Luke 6, 3, 8 says, give, and you will receive. Your gifts will return to you, full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you give back. Let us have a mustard seed of faith to give faithfully today, knowing it will be returned to us in abundance. Let us give cheerfully, not as a debt that we owe, but as a seed that we sow into your kingdom. Open up the windows of heaven and pour blessings on us and our families. Let the majesty of the Father be the light that guides us, the compassion of the Son be the love that inspires us, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be the power that empowers us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let every mouth say, Amen, amen, and amen. There's a quiet place that gives me peace when I'm alone with you. Yeah, there's a hiding place. Your spirit's always there when I'm confused. Yeah, only. All this world won't ever satisfy my heart, it cries, and I Lord, 
Good afternoon. Amen. Are any of you all willing to admit that you need the Lord? That no matter how much rank we get, no matter how big our family grows, no, how to, no matter how fly your kicks are, you still need the Lord. My God, being thirsty. Oh, man. So this is going to be interesting because this thing is wired and I don't want to actually be awkward trying to take it off. So if I if you see me come back, just know I'm being bound because I don't want to be weird. Um, <clears throat> so 
this is the last Sunday of, of the year, excuse me, of the month, and uh, we made it. It ends our 21-day fast, guys. I know there's some of you all who are excited to eat what you want to eat now, drink what you want to drink now, watch what you want to watch now. So I cut back on social media, right, and Instagram. So I love watching funny videos, and I love watching memes. And my brother from another mother always sends me these funny videos and these deep videos. It's like something that's crazy and then something extremely deep. And so I go to Instagram, right, like little messages, and there's some people that talk to me via there. And then I see him. He's just loaded, loaded, loaded. He's not stopping. And I'm just thinking, do I tell him to stop? But tomorrow I'll get to look at all of the funniness that he sent me. Uh, but I was... I was really tempted to click on a lot of those videos. But, okay, let me take another poll because y'all are still asleep. All right, let, I tried to do it that way. So how many of y'all during these 21 days um, heard God just a, just a little clearer, had a longing to read his word just, just a little longer, uh, maybe felt his presence more when you were interacting with a colleague, a coworker, where <laughs> if you weren't fasting... <laughs> If you weren't praying, <laughs> I got one person that's going to be honest and testify and say that they would have gotten some choice words. You probably would have said what you really wanted to say, but the Holy Spirit controlled your tongue. So we thank God that y'all decided to go on this 21-day journey with us, right? How many of you all felt God do something different in your life? Open some doors. Reveal something about who you were doing this time. Maybe lost a thing or two on the way. Has God shown you that the people in your corner needed to leave so that you can have a nice circle? Did, it's not about the amount of people, the quantity of people that's in your corner, but the quality of those who circle around you. Y'all are going to be quiet today. It's, you know, it's okay. It's okay. I'm going to wake y'all up. So Jesus had a fan club. We learned that last week. He had 12 men that he discipled and walked with and ate with, common uh, fishermen, one tax collector, a traitor to the nation, and then he had a backstabber. They all walked with him. But when it was time for Jesus to go into his highest moment, when he was on the mount and he transfigured and they saw Elijah and they saw Moses, there were only three there, John, James, and Peter. And then in his most vulnerable moment, when he did not want to go to the cross, there were only three there. John, James, and Peter. So I am just crazy enough to believe that maybe, just maybe in these 21 days, God began to reveal to you who needed to exit your corner so that your circle could be formed. I think the glasses have thrown y'all off because y'all don't know who I am right now. So let me, let me, let me go back because yeah, because you're a little quiet. What we're going to do today is we are going to just go ahead and turn to Matthew 4, 11. We're going to, we're going to go there. We're going to jump into the word because y'all don't realize that even though the three that were there, They weren't perfect. They were solid, but they were sleepy. They were solid, but they were sleepy. So God is not saying that the, the three people in your, in your circle are going to be flawless, but they'll be faithful. They'll be flawless, but they, they'll be faithful. So we're going we're gonna to pause there. And I'm going to tell you a little story. So some of you guys know that I was in the 
the Army National Guard back in 2010, and, and, and basic training was one of the hardest things that I ever uh, had to go through even later in life, or early in life. I made a lot of mistakes, but because of my experience in college, um, I was able to push through a lot of things, right? But I remember for every unfortunate mistake that we made, we had corrective actions. Smoke. We would get smoked. That means any additional exercises that the drill sergeants deemed good enough for the punishment. And so there were a lot of times we would make mistakes and they would smoke us, but the one thing that they always referenced was Article, excuse me, Army Regulation 600-20. That was the regulation that they, they would reference whenever they were trying to warn us about fraternization. Now see, I don't have to go into what fraternization is because we all know what that is. But see, in, in basic training <laughs> where, where you're kind of locked down and, and all you have is your, your company and your platoon mates, people that you wouldn't speak with on the outside start to look really interesting. You start to form muscles you didn't know could be conformed. You know, like, even though they came, they, everybody bald head, you know, it, the, how the light shines off their head, you're kind of like, oh, that's a, that's a little interesting there, right? So, so it was extremely tempting to have these instant relationships in basic training because of the, because of the uh, environment we were in, right? However, when you start to think about, oh, man, what if they're the one? Man, I deserve to be happy. Who will find out? I always would hear Drill Sergeant Sprave, and she knows I say her name all the time. I would always hear her in her high-pitched voice, which I will not try to imitate, say, if you do that, I'll be disappointed. You'll lose rank. Thus, you'll lose money. So that was something I wasn't willing to do at that time to lose my my little, my little rank <laughs> and my little money. With that being said, just as I remembered her words, what I believe is that sometimes when Satan comes to tempt us, we have to be prepared to fight temptation. So today, we're going to get a lesson in fighting temptation. And in that lesson, there's going to be two major points that we see in this passage of Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. The first lesson will be God allows temptation. God allows temptation. The second lesson or point is to know if you know God's word and you use it accurately and effectively, you can resist falling into temptation. Two simple points today. Now, if you don't mind, I gave y'all some time to find the passage, and it's up. We're going to read the 11 verses together. Well, I'm going to read out loud. Y'all just follow along, as we always do. And the, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, now, after he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But he answered, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him set on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus told him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. Somebody say, be gone. 
be God Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Let's go to the Lord for prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the strategies on how to fight temptation. Be blessed in Jesus' name, amen. God, Jesus is at work. Jesus is at work. When we go through this, Jesus is at work. I want y'all to think that the, the whole time as you're listening, taking notes, Jesus is at work. So before we get directly into the passage we just read, Matthew uh, chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, we see Jesus has come to be baptized by John. And John's humbleness allows him to realize that he is not worthy to baptize Jesus. However, Jesus knows that being baptized is the will for his life. This idea is very clear because Jesus says, let it be so now, for thus is fitting for us to fulfill righteousness. That's in verse 15. Jesus' statement also shows his determination to obey God's will and fulfill the purpose that God had over his life. So they both obey God's will, and the baptism takes place. And then there's like an immediate stamp of approval over Jesus from God. This is the first time in the New Testament where we see the triune God all present in the same place explicitly. The verse says the heavens opens up, the spirit of God descends upon him in the form of a dove, and we hear a voice from heaven, God saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. See, Jesus at this moment had not turned water into wine. I know that's some of y'all's favorite miracle. He had not done it at that point. At this point, Jesus had not allowed eyes to be open people were still blind at this moment Peter hadn't even realized that Jesus was the Christ there were no fancy miracles or great miracles that happened in this moment yet God says you are my son with whom I'm well pleased Jesus had not taught one parable Yet the truth is, God reveals a relationship with Jesus at that very moment. And after an act of obedience, being baptized, he says, I am well pleased with you. See, the truth is the relationship with Jesus and God was already established before the foundations of the earth. The proof is in Genesis where they say, let us make man and woman in our image and likeness. But it was the obedience that pleased God. Family, you are sons and daughters of the Most High. The old Baptist minister would say, you are the lenders and not the borrowers. You are the head and not the tail. And then the whole church will get excited and they'll jump up. But then I'm coming here to say, but are you obedient to what the Lord is asking you to do? Will you say what he's asking you to say? Will you do what he's asking you to do? Will you go where he's asking you to go. I hadn't seen anybody say yay or nay right now. I guess y'all are processing. That's good. Count the cost. Count the cost of discipleship. But if you will go, the question is, will you even go to a dry place? After you experience this great affirmation from God in water, he has quenched your thirst. Will you still follow him? in a dry place. And if in your heart you're saying, yes, this is perfect. This is a perfect message for you. If you're not, just listen. It'll help you. It'll help you. So point one, God allows temptation. I am not saying that every time you are tempted, that is the Lord. But what I am saying is that God allows his people to be tempted. 
Let's look at verse 1 if you don't believe me. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So here I come messing with your theologies again. Everything perfect comes from the Lord. There's no way God can, can tempt you. Okay. Well, this is saying that God, the Holy Ghost, as my grandma would say, the third person in the Trinity, in the triune God, led Jesus, the Logos that we see in John 1, the second person, person of the Trinity in the, the triune God, led him into the wilderness to be tempted. Your question is, well, chaplain, how, how, how do you know that? It's simple. It's because in your English Bible, that S is capitalized. <laughs> in English, nouns are persons, places, and things. You didn't think you was going to get an English lesson today. Common nouns are something for words that are general. Common noun, cat, dog, car, city, right? It's nothing, it's something very general, and it categorizes a person, place, or thing. But see, we have a proper noun. It's very specific. It's not generic. It's for something particular of a person, place, or thing. See, a common noun, I want a car. Proper noun, I want a Lexus LS 500. That's what I want. That's what I want. That's what <laughs> See, the text says that the, the, the spirit is, is capitalized with a big S. And although that actually might be a great way to explain it, that's not the real proof I want to show you. The real proof is in the original Greek. The word pneuma we see here is the same word for spirit. We find that in Matthew 120. With the spirit, that is how Jesus was consumed. That's the same word. We also see that same word in Matthew 3.16, where Jesus now is seeing the dove, the spirit, descend upon him. Very same word. Guys, this is the same spirit that we see in Genesis 1, hovering over the unformed earth, the rukah of God, or Elohim, hovering over the waters. With that being said, I just gave you an English lesson and a Greek lesson. Hopefully that convinces you that God, our God that we serve, actually led Jesus, his son, into the wilderness for a purpose. And that was to be tempted by the devil. Let's be clear. The end of that sentence says to be tempted by the devil. God did not do any of the temptation. Matter of fact, James 1.13 says that no man is tempted by God. He, speaking of God, cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. So just in case anybody wants to make an argument, I did not say that God tempted Jesus. What I said was he led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. Think about it from the beginning of time in Genesis where God issues this holy stipulation to Adam to not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then Adam is happy because he brought him this wife and they're living life in the Garden of Eden. A serpent appears, a talking snake appears, and we know what happens from there. They were tempted to eat, they ate, and sin came into the world. Clearly, the serpent tempted them. But God could have stepped in. God could have blocked it. God could have saw the serpent and like killed it immediately, but he didn't because he wanted them to have a choice. He, God is perfect and cannot tempt. And some believers have an issue with understanding that those tempting situations that you're in, they come for God. Now, why might they be coming from the Lord? Simple. We find that in James as well. He writes, consider it a great joy, my brother, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith 
produces endurance. The word for trials in the Greek comes from the exact same word that temptation comes from. So you can put it like this. The various trials or temptation can produce endurance and patience. God is not doing this as a sick game to see who's going to fail and who's going who's to fall to temptation. It's to produce endurance in your life. Because living on this earth, we need patience and we need endurance. And that is all to conform us to the image of God to bring Jesus glory. Jesus knew that it was God's will for him to be baptized and then tempted. Thus, when Jesus got baptized and went into the wilderness, he was bringing God glory. I'm crazy enough to believe that Jesus knew God was in control, right? Just like you and I know that he's in control. So as he's about to enter into the passage that we just read, he really wasn't worried about Satan's trick, tricks. Why? Because in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it tells us that no temptation is uncommon to any man. I'm giving y'all a lot of scriptures because, man, when temptation comes, you just can't say God is going to bring me out. God is good. Like, you got to have the word, which you will get to, in order to overcome the temptation. So no temptation is overtaking you by that's uh, uncommon to man. But with every temptation, he presents a way of an escape. So every time you're tempted, just know if you look up, there is a way to escape. Which brings us to truth number two. Using or knowing first God's word and using it, it accurately and effectively can help you resist the temptation. And Jesus does this very thing through the entire from verse 3 on down to verse 10, not 11. So, this is if you are doubting, oh, excuse me, the if, right? So, Satan says, if you are God's son, turn these stones into bread. If you are God's son, turn these stones into bread. Before we get there, we have to even realize that in Matthew 3, 15 through 17, God begins to affirm who Jesus is. So this if is to create some sort of doubt this is what many people believe, create some sort of doubt of who you truly are. But I don't personally think that Satan was doubting that Jesus was God's son, right? In Job 1, Satan is actually having a conversation with the Lord, right? So he has that access. He knows who Jesus is. But what I think he's doing, what I believe when looking in the text, this if is actually like a sense, since you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. See, the temptation was not necessarily questioning who Jesus was, but the temptation was for Jesus to prove his relationship with God. And then to provide for himself, so not to depend upon the Lord. I'll say it the same way, but different. So because I have a relationship with God, instead of depending on him, I'm going to use my relationship with God to do something, to gain something that I know he wants me to depend on him on for. Since you are God's son, why don't you feed yourself? That's pretty much what it says. Since you are God's son, why won't you feed yourself? The scripture is very clear, very obvious that after 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus is hungry. He had the power to turn those stones into bread. He had the right to eat. He was hungry. He was finished spending his quality time with the Lord. And guess what? If some of y'all are honest, y'all would have said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna I'm not going to turn these stones into bread. I'm going to turn to some, some meat. I'm going to have me some fish. You know, they, 
They weren't eating the steak at the port that we were. I, I'm going to eat me some fish. I tell you, the first thing I'm doing when I get to America is I'm going to Chick-fil-A. That's, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's where I'm going. So, but, but the, the issue with that is Jesus spending this quality time with the Lord, he knew that it wasn't time yet. It was the enemy telling him to do something and not necessarily God. So instead of saying, you know what, I can turn these birds into my, we see Jesus open his mouth and he speaks and he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 3. And just a little context of what that is saying from verses 1 through 3, it says, you must carefully follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and you may enter and take possession of the land the Lord swore to your fathers. Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey for these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you by letting you go hungry, and then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your fathers had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Him quoting that wasn't just to quote that scripture like Jesus will, will, will feed me, excuse me, God will feed me. The entirety of that passage is hinting at God is my provider. I've been out here on these mountains for 40 days, for 40 nights. God will restore me. Satan was telling him to do something, not God. I mentioned earlier, it wasn't wrong for him to eat, but he had to be discerning on who was telling to him to eat that good thing. So it wasn't the Lord saying, yes, go ahead. It's time for you to replenish yourself. We see the enemy saying, hey, depend on yourself to replenish yourself. I'll tell you, there's some of you guys that are really, really good at providing what you need. But there's nothing like when the Lord provides in his timing for what you need. After a moment of weakness, 40 days, 40 nights without eating or drinking, he was in a very vulnerable space. But he was waiting. He was discerning for the Lord to say, okay, replenish yourself. So Jesus resisted the urge to use his own power to make provisions, but instead he relied on the truth, the word of God. Because God provided for Israel in the past, and he was affirming that God would provide for him in that moment. And next we see Satan takes him to another point, right? Takes him on top of the temple, and he challenges Jesus again. Don't y'all know, like, once you... Hey, once you overcome one temptation, it, it's not going to be a walk in the park. You're like, all right, that was good. Let's try, let's try to get you another way, right? So this is what Satan does. He said, all right, I got you. I tried to appeal to your feelings. I tried to appeal to your desires, to your, to your natural man, right? You're hungry. But you see, you're too good. Eric, you know the word of God. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to... I'm going to speak the word of God to you. And so he quotes Psalm 91, 11 through 12. He says, he will give his angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. I read that just in case you did not believe me, that Jesus, I mean, excuse me, that Satan knows God's words too. See, before I was a believer, my favorite verse to, to quote was Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I wasn't even following Christ, but I knew that I could do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And I said that verse every time I felt someone was trying to hold me back. I said that verse anytime any of my friends were, were down and I wanted to encourage them. And I was like, you know what? Anything is possible. But the sad part is I didn't understand the context of that passage. And I did misuse it out of ignorance. But how many of you could be really honest and admit 
that sometimes in your life you try or you have tried, none of y'all doing this today, but you have tried to co make the scriptures conform to your lifestyle instead of allowing the scriptures to conform you. So, so you take a passage and, and you use it so it can make you feel good versus allowing that passage to convict you and to conform your lifestyle. So maybe, nope, y'all not resonate with that either. Okay. Man, y'all are a tough, tough, tough family today. Like Y'all sleep today. It's okay. It's okay. Um, but I'll be honest with you. Once I stopped shouting about that passage, and I visited church and the pastor said, I'm like, oh, I know that, I, that scripture. And I began to learn, again, still not a Christian, but I began to learn the context of that passage and, and what Paul was talking about. Paul before that says, whether I am hungry or well-fed, I'm content. Paul says he knew how to handle slack and surplus. He could be content in any circumstance he was put in because God had given him the strength. Let me tell y'all something. Before Christ, I would not be able to say anything like that. I don't want to be in slack. I just want to be a surplus. And even now, I have to train my mind that if the circumstance isn't ideal for me, that I will still choose to be content because I'm in that situation for a reason. So, as I work on my contentness and talk to God, I'm like, what you doing up there, right? I realize that I have to have some other word in my belly. So we can get excited to quote John 3.16. Many of you familiar with that passage. I'm going to ask you all to go to John 3.16, scroll, flip. And I said, and then go just read John 3.18. How many people have ever heard just immediately after God, after someone says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that who shall ever believe will not perish, but will have er eternal life? That, they usually stop there. But you go down to 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. See, the reason why I even use that scripture as, a, as an example is because Satan was trying to mislead Jesus by using Psalm 91. And sometimes when we use certain scriptures or, you know, with, for our lives or for someone else, it can be unintentionally misleading. So it is very important that we began to study the proper context so we are not misleading people but helping them. Not pulling wool over our own eyes but being clear about the situation. So Jesus goes ahead and says, well, Jesus go along and he says, he quotes, excuse me, De Deuteronomy 6.16. You should not test the Lord your God. He says that because he understands the intent that the enemy was trying to get at. The intent was basically saying, because you are God's son, make God prove his love towards you. So he read through all of that. And he could have gotten on his high horses, I am God's son. I can actually command the angels to, to save my life if I throw myself from the top of this temple. But because he really knew what the enemy was trying to get at, he was able to use the proper text to speak truth and overcome or resist this temptation. Now, I would say the same thing. Like, just we're going to go back to work life. The 
enemy tells you that this person on your job, subordinate, colleague, or even boss, need their rights read, you need to tell them what they're doing right, but really what they're doing wrong, and how they're getting on your nerves, right? Or maybe somebody in your life has done something evil to you that you just can't forgive. And you're like, you know what, I just need to get them back one good time. If I give them back, then I, then I can forgive them, right? Like, let me just go ahead and you know, hurt their feelings and then move on. That's the enemy telling you to do something contrary to what God's word says. And, and, and I want to point to you what God says in Romans 12, verse 17 through 19. His word says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I repay, I will repay it, says the Lord. Do You see how speaking the word in its context, because some people will say, I don't have to get revenge. Revenge is the Lord, right? Thus says the Lord. But the context, the context is extremely important. And that could potentially stop you from telling people what you feel in your heart. That might be right, but it isn't a good representation of who you are and who God is inside of you. But the enemy keeps going, right? You, you don't quote a scripture twice, and the enemy is still there. So he takes Jesus on this high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, I can give you all of these things if you just fall down and worship me. This probably was the best offer <laughs> that Satan has done this far, right? It keeps Jesus from going to the cross. He don't really have to make all these friends. Um, Judas is not going to stab him in the back, so he won't have these human feelings, right, because he's 100% God. Um, but see, Jesus doesn't even let that thought marinate. He wasn't even like, you know what? <laughs> this world is looking kind of good. Let me just go ahead and tell you, like, let me just worship you so that I can have the word. No, immediately Jesus says, be gone, Satan. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He references Deuteronomy 6.13 almost immediately. See, ultimately, the enemy wants your worship. He wants your time. He wants your focus. And it might not be this outwardly, like, worship, uh, satanic situation. But if, if he could get you distracted long enough to maybe put cars, relationships, your career, money, just th if he could get you long enough to focus on that to where your desire becomes to gain the world over obeying God, then he has you. And then you're ultimately worshiping him. So the best thing to realize is Jesus knows that his purpose, his destiny, it has to go through the cross. It has to go through him healing people. It has to go through his teachings. He cannot reach the destiny of his life if he takes this easy, quick way out. Is there anybody from the South that recognizes that instant grits is not the same as the grits on top of the stove? Can, do you believe that that Kraft box macaroni and cheese is in anywhere comparison to that oven baked macaroni and cheese that I am looking forward to next week? There is something about this instant gratification that is tempting to a point, but it's nothing like the real thing. It's nothing like the process that Massar and Lawrence is going to put inside of that macaroni and cheese that love, that time that she's going to take for it to marinate. <laughs> Listen, no, yeah, no can't, please. If you ever want to bring collard greens to the fellowship, we'll take whatever you, <laughs> whatever you give. 
But there's something special about the process of cleaning those greens. My goodness, my mouth is watering up in here. It's the process. It's the process. And she's rubbing it in. Like, see, I can't even focus. She's talking about it because she, she's getting ready to go home. But it's the process that it takes that makes it all worth it. So, yes, imagine, just imagine, guys, for one minute, if Jesus said, you know what? I don't really want to go do that. I don't really want to see my mother cry because my life is being taken. I don't really want to see my best friends run and hide and cowered out because they've now arrested me. My heart can't take God, me walking with this dude for three years, knowing that he is going to trade me in for 30 pieces, piece, pieces of silver. And if he would have been tempted enough to, do, to satisfy himself instantly, then this perfect being would have actually sinned and become a sinner and not any different from you and I. And so his action to not be instantly gratified is the reason why we have access to God now. So temptation is not just about not answering that phone call. Temptation is not actually about not eating that piece of red velvet cake. I'm just going to food today. Y'all can tell how I'm feeling. Because I want to lose weight. Temptation is about the impact, the longevity of generations that comes after you. That decision that you potentially make could steer your children's children, your, your nephew's children, your niece's children, or whatever legacy, your spiritual children, that God placed inside of you. So Jesus resisting temptation was just not to flex his muscles, to show how strong he was. Jesus' accomplishment in resisting temptation was for you and for I. See, he was able to do those things because of the word of God. This may have not been the most exciting message, but I gave you a lot of scripture to help you for when the temptation comes. And I'll tell you something. It's one thing coming to get a word, right? Hearing a word from the Lord via a friend, via a minister. But how many of y'all tempted right now by the enemy sitting in this, y'all not gonna raise your hand anyways, but how many of y'all tempted right now in this very moment in this congregation, in this building, the enemy is telling you to do something that you know you shouldn't be doing? Probably nobody, right? But oh, Monday and Tuesday, and maybe when you walk outside of this door, there's gonna be something that you'll be tempted to do. So it's one thing, hearing a word spoken over you, it's another thing than having it in your belly. So when that person who usually gives you that encouragement is not around, you're able to still stand firm and not allow your destiny to be detoured because of the temptation. Will you have the word in your belly to fight temptation? Earlier I mentioned that Jesus was obedient and was baptized. John, before Jesus came on the scene, would always say, repent, basically turn away from your wicked ways and be baptized. Baptism was significant and it symbolized being cleansed of your sins. Yet Jesus does not need to be baptized because he's perfect. But he does that because it symbolizes the upcoming ministry that he's about to prepare. It symbolizes the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he also does it because he who knew no sin was going to take on sin for this entire world. Bow your heads with me.
bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord, when we are baptized, we are identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we know that water does not save us, God. Water does not help us fight temptation. We must repent and ask for your forgiveness and most importantly, ask Jesus to be Lord over our lives. And if Jesus is not in your life today and you know that you are on the wrong team and you're tired of fighting and losing the battle to temptation, won't you consider giving your life to Christ? See, sin entered this world through one man's disobedience. And the wages of sin is death. And we all owe that debt. But glory be to God that Jesus Christ took on our sins and paid our debt. And the best news is that he rose in three days and today lives. And no, you won't be perfect. But I guarantee now you have the stance to be able to fight temptation. And God, for those of us who are a part of your family, Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. We thank you that the Holy Spirit reminds us what you've already taught us. So when the enemy tries to say something contradictory to your word, we have the tools to fight temptation. God, we thank you that you have never left us and you will never forsake us as we fight temptation. Give us the endurance and the patience to continue to fight temptation. Lord, be with our families and help them fight temptation. God is not about the perception. It's all about our destiny. And so we thank you for showing us, Jesus, how to put our dukes up and fight temptation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My God. My God, that's that's it today. Saints, go ahead and stand and I will dismiss you all. Do any of y'all feel like y'all got some word to to be able to to fight temptation just a just a little longer, right? Now them few scriptures that get you get you through the end of the day. <laughs> get you through the end of the day. All right. Ah, listen, I can't wait to see you all. Please invite a friend um, to, to the fellowship if you can. We want, like I said, we want the gospel service to be known as a generous uh, service. Um, if you don't plan on cooking, still come. Because I, I see that a lot. People will walk out of here. They're like, oh, I didn't bring anything. And so they decide not to come. But I'm telling you, still come. It's a, it's a good time. We got enough room back there. And lastly, if you haven't signed up for something, you can sign up. We already got the, the food for you. We just need you to make it and bring it back. Is that good? That's a good deal? Michael, what you making? I'm joking, Michael. <laughs> I pickle him. All right. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for giving us the tools to continue throughout this week, God. Uh, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who is alive and well, is active and is working. And I pray that the word said today will activate and strengthen the muscles of your people, Lord. As they leave this building, be with them. Remind them that they have never lost. They have never lost the battle because you are fighting it for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.